If you're listening to this podcast in real time, you may or may not know that we're both celebrating our podcast launch and the launch of our brand new Mum Safe Trainer offering. If you're a trainer that works with mums and wants to be known as the go to trainer for mums in your area, you need to head to www.jendugard.com forward slash Mum Safe Trainer and find out more. I'll see you there. Welcome to episode one of the Mum Safe Movement podcast. I'm your host, Jen Dugard, and I'm here to help you to own your own shit and level up your mum focused fitness business so that you can have the biggest impact possible on your own life and the lives of the community of women that you serve. For episode one, I thought it would be a good idea for you to get to know me. I wanted to set the stage for openness vulnerability, honesty, and insight. I want you to know that this is a place you can feel safe and you can be yourself. And for our guests that come along as we move forward to do the exact same thing. I want you to realize if you haven't done already that business just like life is a little bit messy. So who better to invite than my best friend, Sarah? Sarah and I met when she was a Body Beyond Baby mum many, many years ago. We've been through so many ups and downs together. She knows my life. She knows my business journey. And I wanted her to help me to share my journey with you so that we start as we mean to go on. I truly hope you enjoy today's episode and that you'll join me as we go on this journey to create the Mum Safe Movement podcast. <laughs> I don't even know how to start. Yeah, that's always the hardest part, I guess. Well, I guess you asked me to interview you for your podcast because we've known each other for a decade. A long time. Yeah. Very long time. Yep. And we've gone through heaps of different things, ups and downs, professionally and personally. And friendship stuff and it felt like a good more comfortable fit I guess to be interviewed by someone that kind of already knows the gist of your life and can talk about all the shit that you forget about or yeah yeah can prompt delve deeper (laughs) yeah (laughs) yes and also can call you on your bullshit (laughs) yeah that is what I expect you will be bullshitting okay (laughs) (laughs) um yeah so why did you want to start the podcast? So the Mum Safe Movement podcast came about because of my desire to help other fitness professionals understand or help fitness professionals that are driven to change the way that mums are looked after in the industry Mm -hmm. in a way that's more efficient than I ever did it. So what I became, I guess, aware of is you know, you start a business, you do all these things, you try and do them in the order that you think that they need to be done. And then along the way, or in hindsight, and the beauty I've got now is I look at all the different people that I've been to for coaching or guidance or ask questions to, and I kind of go, oh, if I'd done that first, maybe I would have got there quicker, or maybe I wouldn't have made those 12 mistakes. And maybe I wouldn't have wasted the money on the thing. Um, Not to say all of the experiences weren't good and valid but what I want to do especially with the first series is bring into this space all of the people that I've learned from so that the fitness professional that wants to change the way mums are looked after in the industry can do it quicker and more efficiently and have the impact that they are truly capable of yeah so they're not going to start being blamed from scratch like you were yeah yeah Yeah. And it's interesting because some people, you know, I have conversations with trainers all the time and some of them say to me, oh no, I'll come back when I've created my business. And I always find that kind of interesting because one of the biggest awarenesses that we have as fitness professionals is the client that says, oh no, I'll come back to you when I've got fit. And you're like, don't you understand that if I work with you now, you could save so much time and so much energy Mm. and we could just get you there quicker. But yeah, you know, everyone has to do it at the right time. <laughs> yeah. Timing is everything. Um, 
All right. Well, that was kind of a, a start about why starting a podcast, mm. but why don't we start at the beginning? Okay. And <laughs> the beginning of you. <laughs> so do you want to kind of tell me a little bit about where you're from, like your background, um, what your yeah. life was like as a kid? Absolutely. So I, I grew up in the UK. Um, I grew up in a, a city called Stoke-on-Trent, which is not the most glamorous place in the world. Um, very working class. And I, I guess I, I was thinking about kind of school kind of time. I enjoyed primary school and then it rapidly went downhill after that. Okay. So the transition from primary to high school was a kind of key moment, I guess, for you? Yeah, I mean, I, I, in primary school, I I was definitely bullied all the way through. Like, I feel like everywhere I went in like my school environment, whether it's primary school, then through to high school, and then through to college, which is the last two years of, of school in the UK, um, somebody followed me. So my, I although I enjoyed primary school, there was you know one or two girls that targeted me the whole time, mm. um, which always made me feel kind of on the outer of other people. And, yeah, I feel like moving to high school, I was really lucky that I moved from primary school to high school with a a big group of friends. Mm. Um, But I still managed to find, or they found me, I don't know, um, the people that just hassled me the whole way way through school. Yeah, I, I don't know. I wouldn't wish school on anyone and now here I am with kids in school (laughs) trying not to put my experience of me on them um yeah so what would you say you were kind of like your personality like as a a kid at primary and secondary I I feel like I was always driven Mm -hmm. like I I did gymnastics as a kid and I remember wanting to work hard I definitely wasn't the best like I I was the kid that needed to work hard to you know, there was some maybe natural ability there, but I wasn't, you know, the super flexible kid or the super strong person. Yeah. I had to to work to get the results. Um, and then I always, like, I remember I wanted to be on stage when I was a kid and I would, there was a, a newspaper called The Stage and I would go through this newspaper for auditions and and I actually don't think I was that good either but I was so I wanted to be on stage and I wanted to dance and I wanted to sing I can't sing um but I was so driven like I'd go through this newspaper every week and I'd circle all these auditions and I, I look back and I managed to convince my dad at one point to drive me from Stoke to Manchester every week so I could take part in this theatre workshop because it was nothing yeah. where we grew up from so I think I was I knew what I wanted to do and I was like I'm just going to make it happen regardless so I that inbuilt what is that is that drive or just fucking stubbornness <laughs> like yeah, I don't know totally. what it is the combination yeah it to, sounds like gymnastics also gave you like that kind of discipline and ethic or like hard work maybe set the foundation yeah I think it did and I don't think I ever I don't think I ever thought things would just be given to me I didn't have a hard life as a kid. Um, it wasn't, you know, we definitely didn't have everything, but we didn't go short. Um, yeah, it, like it's funny now I think about things through the lens of being a parent and mm-hmm. I look at my kids and I'm like, do I make life too easy for them? Um, yeah, it's interesting, isn't it? Yeah, <laughs> definitely. And it is interesting because I know your children, obviously. Yeah. It sounds like you're describing your daughter when you describe yourself, like everything you just reflected on there. Really? Yeah, like the stage and the drama and the auditions. She's better than me, though. Like, she's <laughs> naturally way better than I ever was. Well, maybe you were as good as India, but you don't see it because of your self-esteem issues from the bullying. <laughs> maybe. But then I think then sometimes I get frustrated with her and go, why don't you Why don't you just fucking do it? Like, why don't you get driven and do the thing that I wanted to do? And then I go, that wasn't my, that's not my, my experience is not to put my experience, no, it's not up to me to put my experience yeah. on her and my wants and my desires. But I actually see the flip side in her and I go, I feel like she's going to be one of those people that the success comes to her because she actually doesn't give a fuck. Mm. I'm not saying that she doesn't because, yeah. again, I'm not in her head and I can only speak from my observation of her um it's interesting though she doesn't care anywhere near as much as I did about achieving the things mm. but I guess that's like India isn't it no she's in 
yeah. the moment all the time and just enjoys it until she doesn't and then moves on yeah but how, like I don't get that <laughs> how can you put that much effort in and then just move on like what <laughs> I <don't> understand <laughs> interesting interesting mm. Mm, definitely <laughs> Um, so yeah, your your family then. You're the oldest sister. Mm-hmm. And you've got a younger sister. Yeah, who still lives in England. And do you want to talk a bit about that kind of dynamic growing up? I'm four years, three and a half, four years older than her. It's it's interesting because I I mean we obviously had a dynamic, and I was the older kid, and the the things that stand out, and I remember is sitting on the couch and yelling upstairs back in the days when there was no remote control on the TV. <laughs> so I would yell up the stairs for her to come down the stairs and change the TV channel because I couldn't be bothered to get off the couch. Like that's <laughs> what I remember. <laughs> or convincing her to go to the shops and buy me the stuff I wanted from the shops mm. so I didn't have to go do it. Um, but I left the UK when she was still quite young. Like we'd, we'd never had that, um, I guess, teenager time together I remember we used to fight like Mm. physically fight I remember her throwing chicken curry on my head once (laughs) (laughs) after an argument is that the Um, time she just like tipped it yeah Yeah, I remember that story (laughs) (laughs) like what even is that um so I but I also remember us getting along I remember us not getting along more than I remember us getting along Mm. but I'm sure we must have gotten along too we did yeah but I think because of that bigger age gap, like when I look at my kids, they're two years apart. And then Sarah and I being three and a half, four years apart, that's big when you're mm. younger. And I think yeah. had I not left when I left, we would have caught each other. Yeah, because you left England when you were 18. Yeah, I finished yeah. school. And then I was like, we finished school in what, June, July for the holidays. And yeah. I was gone by September, October. Yeah. Yeah, that's a big developmental gap, like 18 to 14 if you'd stayed to 22 and she was like 18 that's that different type of exactly yeah yeah cool um the only thing I wanted to flip back on was when you talked about being bullied at school Mm. um you know and then what that kind of has done to your potential self-esteem or you know you still talked as if you know this very driven focused like determined person who was wanting to audition and get on the stage and you know when you kind of compare that to I guess the typical um, image people would have of someone that was like horrendously bullied, like consistently for years and years, they kind of don't match. <laughs> so I'm just wondering like, you know, how, or did it help you build resilience? Like where, what do you look back and reflect on that side of things now? Yeah, that's really interesting. I think um, I tried to fit in a lot. So then I'm like, why was I trying to do those things? But I wasn't necessarily with groups of friends that were doing, like, you know, we, I did dance with, with friends and mm. things like that. But what comes to mind straight away is was I looking for my way out? So I there was no doubt in my mind. I came to Australia when I was, I think I was 12, 11 or 12. My mum brought me to Australia dad took me to America in the same year so we had different contrasting mm. experiences of holidays and as soon as I came to Australia I knew that I wanted to come back I knew that I wanted to live here and I also had an uncle who worked in the Australian film industry okay. so from being like 12 13 having that experience that set the stage for me wanting to come back to Australia as soon as I could mm. which was when I left school so I'm wondering whether being driven to do those things were my inner knowledge that I just wasn't staying. Mm. Yeah, and it's interesting as well because, you know, you're saying you came here where you were kind of 11 and 12, that cusp of like, you know, moving through the transition from girl to young adult and women and you've got an uncle in the film and theatre industry in Australia in a culture that you really like, you know you want to live here and then you go back and then you're like, pounding through the stage magazine and going for auditions and you know maybe maybe that kind of all linked maybe I I feel like I didn't ever feel like I belonged where I grew up Mm. like whether that's from I mean it would have been from the way I got treated as a kid at school to yeah I, I don't know I just never we weren't from there like I was born in Manchester we spent some time in my sister was born in in Nottingham then we moved to Stoke so I don't think I ever had that affinity 
to the place. Yeah. We didn't have we didn't have any family there. Um, yeah, I never felt like I belonged there. Okay. So you were always kind of coasting around for like the next I, adventure. Get out? <laughs> <laughs> Where am I going next? Yeah. <laughs> All right. Well, that kind of explains like why you chose Australia then at 18. Like if you'd had such a good experience when you were 12, like those formative years, it was like this, you know, magical place, I guess you wanted to come back to. Yeah, I think um, I knew I wasn't staying in Stoke. Mm. I, um, you know, when you, you, you're finishing school and your parents like, you know, you're going to go to uni, what are you going to do? And I didn't want to go to uni, but I applied anyway just to, to do the thing that they wanted me to do. Yep. Um, and I think I thought there was two things. One thing was, well, I'm not staying in Stoke anyway. I'm going to go to Manchester. I'm going to go to London. So I might as well go to Australia because who goes home every weekend anyway? No one does. You think you can, but no one does. <laughs> and then also if I go to Australia, everyone will think I'm doing something cool, even if I'm just working in a shop. And my parents don't have to say, oh, no, she's working in the shop down the road. They're like, she's in Australia. Mm. So there was kind of a way out that didn't feel like I wasn't doing either what was expected of me or just doing nothing. When you moved to Australia with it, was it in the intention that you were just going to live there forever or was it like, oh, I'm doing a year backpacking, just work experience, I'll be back soon? It was never the year backpacking. Like yeah. I didn't come with a backpack, I came with a suitcase. <laughs> You're not a backpacker. I'm not a backpacker. <laughs> or a camper. <laughs> I'm a fucking backpacker or a camper. No. Um how would I survive in a hostel? Like, I'd be like, guys, this is not okay. <laughs> I can hear you talking. Now you're breathing. Like, please be quiet. And breathing. Someone's talking too loudly. <laughs> um, I travelled a little bit before I got here. So mum had a friend who was living in New Mexico. So I went to New Mexico. Then I went to New Zealand. And then I came to Sydney. So I was like, oh, yeah, I'm doing, doing the travel thing. But there was never really the I'm coming to Sydney and then I'm going to go travel. It was I'm coming to Sydney. I'm going to live here for a year. I do think in the back of my mind, I was like, there's nothing to go back to. And I say that with love for my family, because obviously I could have gone back to my family. But for me as a, a young woman wanting to take that next step, there was nothing to go home for. Mm. So I think deep down, I knew that I wasn't going back. And yeah. if I did go back, I was kind of like with the caveat of I can get into uni now because I have life experience <laughs> and stories to tell. <laughs> yes. Yeah. <laughs> All right. So you did a bit of traveling before you landed in Sydney. Did you have a plan when you got here? Like you, you had you mentioned you had family here. So you, did you have like a kind of like a little bit of a security that, you know, you had someone to base yourself with? Yeah, I did. I staying in a hostel. No, I did not stay in a hostel. <laughs> <laughs> I stayed. I actually stayed with my uncle that worked. That was the camera. He's passed away since, but he was a camera operator. Mm -hmm. And I knew I needed to go get a job. So I did that, but I also knew I wanted to get out in, onto TV sets and he took me, uh, I think the first set I worked on was the set of Better Homes and Gardens um, and my desire to get into film from there had, or film and TV had kind of switched from the, the acting side of things yeah. to, well, I just want to get on a set and figure out what I want to do. Um, so I spent time working yeah on whatever sets he was on which was mostly better homes and gardens and then I had a, a, a boyfriend at the time who I met a few months after being in Australia and his next door neighbor worked on All Saints the the Australian drama yeah. so then so it was like better homes and gardens okay now how do I get onto this set of All Saints and when I was on the set of better homes and gardens I basically followed the camera assistant around um he was kind of a hot guy so when <laughs> But no, I, I was fascinated by the camera side of things and I didn't want to do hair and makeup. Like I probably was, I was never a girly girl and, yeah. and whether that's just what that felt like. But yeah, I, I just got as much work experience as I possibly could when I came to Australia in film. And, and back to your first question was my base was with my uncle mm -hmm. and I stayed there for about six months, I think, before I, I did move into share accommodation, <laughs> not a backpackers. <laughs> Cool. Yeah. All right. Um, so how long did you work kind of filming TV? And, you know, how did you end up where you are now? Like you're in fitness. So like that's quite a change, you know, from working in that film and TV industry with like camera operators. And yeah. Like you kind of, you were like an assistant kind of runner kind of thing. Is that? Yeah. So in film you have a, 
the person that does like take one, take two and, yeah. and marks the, the scene. And then you have a focus puller and, and the focus puller stands next to the camera operator and the camera operator's job is to point, look through the camera and to point the camera. But the focus puller's job is to go, okay, so the person that's supposed to be in focus is now walking towards me. So you've got to know that now they're at three foot, now they're at two foot okay. um, and keep them in focus. So And so they actually turn the dial. Yeah. And that's what you did. Yeah, but you can't see that it's is or isn't in focus. Oh. you just got wow. to judge the distance and know that that is the right focal distance. Wow, that's quite intuitive then, isn't it? It was really cool. Like I really enjoyed that part of, of yeah, I guess getting good at judging those distances mm-hmm. and, and reacting on the fly. You do spend a lot of time marking the floor though, so you know where those distances <laughs> actually are. <laughs> but I, I spent five years working in film and... I went down to Melbourne. I slept on the floor of a friend's cafe, like in their spare room, with surrounded by like polystyrene cups, because I was so determined to get into the film industry. Yeah. And, and there was this film being shot, and I they wouldn't pay me to go. I had to be there as a local if I wanted to do the job. Okay. So I was like, sure, I'll just stay where I can, do what I yeah. what I can to to do the work. Um, I did a lot of free work, so a lot of cups of tea got made, lots and lots of you know, just doing whatever I could do to be on set. But I came up to, you know, five years in, I'd probably spent three years being paid for what I was doing, a year and a half not being paid whilst working, doing other things. And I just started to wonder whether that's Mm. what I wanted to do. I'd met Ben by that time. We met working on a film set and it started to become more and more apparent, like if we were going to stay together, can't have kids and both being filled. Oh, you can, but it's really hard. Like there's nannies and they'd be nannies there from 6 a.m. until 8 o'clock because if you're on a film set and it's got to get done, mm. it's people like with all due respect to the film industry, no one is saving a life yet. They act like they are. Yeah, like it's <laughs> like the overtime is expected yeah. above a note. Like the amount of times mm. I saw people, you know, miss anniversary dinners or miss a child's thing or not be able to go somewhere because it was life or death that we finished this scene tonight and I do understand there's copious amounts of money when you're when you're filming things but that just started to not feel right to me and at a similar time I you know my background was gymnastics but I didn't I hadn't trained at all since in, being in Australia like that five years Probably, I I think I started training definitely when I came here at 18. I stopped doing everything until I was probably about 18, 19, probably about three, four years. I didn't do any exercise. I cannot conceive of that. You're the crazy person that gets up at like five in the morning every day. (laughs) Well, I was getting up at five to go work in film. But (laughs) yeah, I didn't do anything. But I think I also had no body image stuff going on at all like avoided that my whole life had no self-awareness around body image but I found myself I started going to the gym around that 23 Mm. 22 23 no maybe a bit younger and then I moved over to the eastern suburbs when I started when I was um I moved I'm trying to remember why but I moved over to the east and I started to do a fitness first boot camp down at Coogee Beach. Mm. And I was like, I can do this. I can tell people what to do. And my brain was already thinking maybe I want to get out of film. Mm. So I then went up to fitness first Bondi Platinum when it first opened. So I was one of those like members before the gym has even opened the door. And then I had a personal trainer and throughout doing boot camp and having a personal trainer of my own and thinking about leaving the industry, the the film industry, I then decided to do my Cert 3 and 4 to become a boot camp instructor. And then I realised how much they got paid and I was like, fuck that, I'm going to be a PT. (laughs) (laughs) I'm not standing on the beach for 30 bucks when I can earn 60 to 100 bucks in a warm gym. Hmm. Well, that makes sense. Um, what made you suddenly start exercising though, like at 23 and like, you know, to the point you were getting a personal trainer at a fancy new gym and all that kind of stuff? You know, I don't know exactly. Mm. What I do know is I had a couple of friends. So I worked in a music shop when I was, that was how I paid for my life when I wanted to be in film, but I wasn't in film full time. I worked in a music shop and I, there was two girls in there. One of them was a really good friend of mine and we, we kind of parted ways a few years ago, but 
there was the two women I was working with and they talked nonstop about, it was like, you know, the Weight Watchers, the point system. Yeah. And I'm not saying that that was why I started going to the gym, but for someone that grew up with no awareness of my body at all, like even at 18, nothing, Mm -hmm. 19, 20, you know, whatever. But I was suddenly in this, was I suddenly or I've never really thought about Mm. what got me into a gym, but I know at that time I was with other females that were always talking about what food they were going, that was going into their mouth and always talking about their weight. And somehow throughout that period, I ended up in the gym. Okay. But I also kind of look back and go, it was inevitable to come from a gymnastics background. I was always going to do, I always like to think of it as, you know, your parents, um, instill good food habits into you, you do good movement. And then at some point you're going to rebel against it all, eat all the McDonald's, eat all the shit, not yeah. do the exercise, go out, you know, drink, take drugs, whatever you're going to do. But then you'll come full circle because you've given that, that grounding. Mm. When I see my son buy all the sugar from the shops, I'm like, fuck at some, some point it'll come full circle and he will be okay. Yeah, that's Okay. I just think it's interesting because like you're like a fit pro now and mm. you know I think I imagine a lot of um, the motivation a lot of your kind of business is under is trying to establish what drives people to come back to exercise yeah so I'm just wondering if there was a link centered yeah okay so you went and did cert three and four yep and you said that was for like boot camp stuff? That's what I thought I wanted to do. Yeah. I very quickly learned that my personal trainer got paid way more than the boot camp mm. instructors did. And so my personal trainer at the time became my mentor. So back in the day, you could do your cert three, and I did that face to face. And then you could do your cert four and start working as a personal trainer as long as you're on the gut gu- under the guidance of a mentor while you were doing that certificate four. And he was he gave me a lot of really good business skills. Um, I'd already grown up. So the audiobooks in my dad's car were all the Zig Ziglar, John D. Martini, Jim Rowan, like all the old school business people, which now I'm doing that to my children, like with all the audiobooks. <laughs> listen to this. It'll be good so for you. Is that what you listen to? Will you be to Manchester for your Probably. Theater? <laughs> But there was a lot of business, business audio CDs. Yeah. Okay. So I knew, so, you know, the film journey was good and the reasons to get out, you know, because of family were, were potentially good, although we weren't there yet. But I also got frustrated because in film, it doesn't matter how good you are at your job. If either the work is not available or somebody wants their best friend to do the job, you don't get the job. Okay. So I remember spending a lot of time, like I would go through, there was a, a book called The Production Book, not the stage anymore, it's The Production Book. Okay. And it had all the lists of all the, the director of photography's, the phone numbers in there, and I'd call them. I'd call every single one trying to get work. So just cold calling? Cold calling. You know, sometimes maybe they'd know of someone through someone so I could name drop. But I did a lot of cold calling and... I could see people that had been in the industry longer than me Mm. not moving as fast as I wanted to move. So I think I realised that there was this seat like ceiling, Mm. one on the availability of work, two on how much people would pay me, and three, I couldn't just go out and make my own work. Mm. So there was a few things that, that kind of just didn't sit right. And when I went into personal training... My mentor had me on a a sliding scale. So it was like, okay, so he paid my rent for the first three months or, you know, you get a rent-free period and then he paid that. But in return for that, I didn't get all the money that the personal training client paid me. So what does that mean, the rent-free period? Is that where you like rent the space in the gym? Yeah, in a fitness first. So I was in a fitness first and you pay a certain amount of money per week to be in the gym. I thought you meant you was paying your rent in your apartment. I was like, no, that would have been cool. (laughs) No. Um, but he set me these goals and it was like, if, you, if you're doing five clients a week, you get paid. I might've got paid 20 bucks as client. I don't know. I can't remember, you know, but then there was a maximum amount and it might've been 30 sessions per week. And I was then maybe getting $50 out of the 75 that he was getting paid okay. from the clients. So to me, that was just like, well, why wouldn't I get there as quick as I could? And I could see how if I put in more effort and I was, you know, making connections on the gym floor and I was committed to what I wanted to get done, I could get the results. 
And then I knew that that situation wasn't going to last forever anyway. And he actually, he left the gym. It was supposed to be a 12 month Mm. mentorship and he left at nine months, which at the time suited me because by nine months I was like, that's been great. I would have honored the relationship, but he left and I was like, sweet. Now I can charge what I want. I can work as much as I want and I can take it all home. So that was way better. (laughs) So how long did you then work as a personal trainer? I was up at Bondi Platinum for until until basically until Marley was born. So two months before he no two weeks before he was born, oh. I stopped working up there. So from two thousand and sixteen to two thousand, he was born in two thousand and eighteen. Yeah, it was supposed to be four weeks, but he yeah. was two weeks early. Two thousand eight. Fuck two thousand eight. <laughs> two thousand six yeah. to two thousand eight. Four years. Whatever. No, I do not. <laughs> yeah. Okay. Do you want to do that bit again? No. Cool. Um, all right. I want to put a pause on the um, personal training bit just for a minute before we dive off into how you then made your own business. Yeah. Became who you are. And go back to when you said you met Ben yep. on the movie set. <laughs> <laughs> Sounds so glamorous, wasn't it? It does Was sound it glamorous. Glam. Well, only because obviously he's your husband and the father of your children and you've had this relationship develop alongside your business. Um, so can you tell us a little bit more about how you met him and where all that came from? We, he's a light, he's in lighting. So he's a, he's a gaffer for anyone that doesn't know film term. It's the the head lighting guy. He wasn't the head lighting guy then. Um, and the camera department, I needed some power. So I asked this guy for some power. Can I please have some power? (laughs) Have have a, a, a lead, like whatever. Um, yeah, we were working on Farscape. I don't know if you remember that um sci-fi no. random sci-fi show Jim is it Jim Henderson the Muppets guy oh yeah yeah uh and we we worked on that film for I don't I can't remember if it was three months or six months but he pretty much flat out resp- refused to talk to me the whole time <laughs> and you know when you like you're attracted to someone and then they don't want to talk to you and at first it's like okay well this is fun and in the end I was like you're a fucking dick you won't even talk to me <laughs> So by the time the film ended, I think I was just like, no, nah, I'm done. And then we got together at the rap party and his, the rap party is the thing that happens at the end of every job. And his kind of reasoning was, well, I just wanted to be professional while I was at work and I didn't want people talking. And I was like, okay, whatever, whatever. Okay, <laughs> fine. But you got together then? We did. Okay. Yep. And that was when? Probably three years before Marley was born. We did everything relatively. Yeah, it's like we, we met each other. We got together. We moved in together after a year. We got engaged after two years. We got married after th- three years. And then maybe that was when Marley was born. Or maybe it was we moved in after. I don't know. It was something like that. <laughs> okay. Um, and so Ben, has he's still in lighting. He's still working in that industry. He is. After all the shit things I've just said about film. <laughs> he's head of his department, though. Yeah. So, but he still has to... You know, find the the, the the director of photography has to employ the gaffer, right? Mm. So there's still someone, you know, it's still network driven. Yeah, 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 yeah. Okay. But you'd made that leap out of school. How did that go when, like, you left? Because you know the hours that you described in the film set and the commitment it takes. Um, you know, and then you're a personal trainer, probably also working very, very early in the morning. And how did you guys keep the relationship going? I think it was fine. Like in film. You get up early. So really the transition to being a PT mm. versus film, except I could come home, have a nap, and then <laughs> then go back to work if I wanted to, whereas he just had to work the whole day. Yeah. So, um, you know, I was, what, early 20s. I don't feel like there was a big shift. Mm. I don't think there was a – I was like, okay, cool. Okay. Yeah. All right. So that's the main, the beginning. The beginning. <laughs> the beginning. <laughs> the easy beginning. And then we'll cover the middle and the current. <laughs> Cool. All right. So you have left film. You're working in um, PT at like a big, big box gym. Yep. What made you step away from that? It was purely having Marley. Although I do know that when I became a trainer, I wanted to run a business, not just be a PT. And I say the word just with hesitation because there's nothing wrong with being what you want to be. And, And a personal trainer is has so much responsibility and she can do so much good in the world. But I knew when I moved out of film and into personal training that there was a business that I wanted to build. Didn't know what it was, but I knew I wanted to build something. Hmm. 
And then Marley was born in 2008 (laughs) and I had left, like I'd kind of said, you know, can I come back in three months' time? Can I come back in six months' time? But I think similar to when I left the UK, like there was this, I could go back if I wanted to, there was a safety net, but I never really wanted to go back into um, being a personal trainer in a big box gym again. I wanted to start my own business. Yeah. And I did that. So I started a blog when Marley was, after Marley was born, and it was called Body Beyond Baby. Yep. Um, but then it was the the journey of how to get my body back, which yep. is not what I believe in now uh, at no. all. <laughs> However, if anyone wants to go look at that blog, it does still exist. It's bodybeyondbaby.blogspot.com. Just right <laughs> <laughs> and it was all about how am I going to get my body back? You know, all the DEXA scans, all the yeah. the weighing myself and all that kind of thing. That I feel like that was really cultural of the time though as well because we had babies around about the same time. Yeah. My first was 2007. So I just feel like that was always the focus. And it was, all, I mean, it's probably still is, but I just don't buy into any of that anymore. Yeah. But, you know, it's always in the celebrity mags, you know, like how whoever got their body back like six weeks after giving birth and you're like, yeah, it, it is. And it, I, I guess the, what preceded that was, you know, when I started working with a personal trainer and he was amazing, but in hindsight, there's certain things that he guided me to do from a nutrition perspective that definitely instilled, as well as the the female friendships I had at the time, instilled um, a disordered eating pattern. So mm-hmm. when I got married before I had Marley, I was 49 kilos. Wow. I don't even think like I could weigh 49. Like even if I was like zero body fat now, I couldn't weigh 49 kilos. Mm-hmm. My 15-year-old son weighs 54 kilos. Yeah. That's the 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 getting my body back was preceded by basically an eating disorder that was not diagnosed. Mm. And I think it's really important that in the industry we talk about the fact that the things that we say to people and, and that assumption that, that a woman wants to get her body back or an assumption that even a woman without a child wants to lose weight and that's why she's in the gym because... You know, I actually don't know if when I walked into the gym as a in my early 20s, if I wanted to lose weight. I cannot remember. I've got journals, so I should probably, I could look it up. But I know that that's what my trainer gave to me. And I was guided, like all the strength training and stuff was really good. Like I thrived on the strength training, but the nutritional guidelines of eating less, eat the low-fat yogurt, only eat half the sandwich, for afternoon tea Mm. led to standing in Woolies comparing the fucking back of rice crackers to see which one had less calories. So, so having a baby, there was already this, I'd been smaller than I'd ever been before and I'd enjoyed it. And that was in prep for the wedding. It wasn't in prep for the wedding, but I think, I don't know why, like, women just fucking lose weight before they get married. And I actually, I know that when I was already tiny in the lead up to the wedding, I cannot remember being on a diet, Mm. but I know I lost weight, but I also remember going, Oh, that's good. I've lost weight. So there's, I'm one of those people that just naturally loses it. (laughs) Yeah. But clearly you don't fucking eat properly anyway. So maybe you just forgot to eat more than you usually do. So then when I had Marley, there was definitely the, I'd been in the best shape of my life, whatever that means, or what what I thought was that. And then there was the desire to get back to that, like get that body back mm. after having him. Yeah. So that was the blog and okay. all of the the weight loss. And I look back now and I'm just like, yeah, it's fascinating. But then the blog became the business. Okay. So from misguided, (laughs) misguided roots. I thought I'd just (laughs) tell other women how they could get their body back. (laughs) Well, how, first of all, so that's, you know, that's a huge, let's acknowledge it. You're like in a mum focused industry, like your first baby, your first pregnancy, your first labor, your first birth is massive. Like it's one of the biggest things in the world that will change who you are. So the, the concept of going back to who you were before is always hard like whether that's body or personality or Mm. mindset shift or whatever, but how did you find 
the pregnancy and the changing body and the experience of being pregnant and then mentally and emotionally and that transition to motherhood like you know I don't think I really was super aware mm. so I was 27 I had a relatively easy pregnancy I trained the whole way through I had had a history of like depression in my late teens probably due to being on the pill, which I, I don't, I can't say that that's the whole truth, but I feel like that was some of the truth. Mm-hmm. Now, Billy, now knowing Billy that I know. wouldn't have helped that either. Yeah. Yeah. So I think that I did not have anywhere near, I know I did not have anywhere near the self-awareness that I have now. Hmm. So I was 27. I had a baby. The pregnancy was relatively easy. The birth was relatively easy. I mean, not super easy, but I didn't, think that it was hard like I had a Bontu's delivery and got told my pelvic floor was was too strong which I thought that was a good thing back then um but I didn't I almost just went I'm gonna have a baby I'll keep training the way that I am training I did drop my weights a little bit but I didn't understand anywhere near what I did now but I just figured I would just keep doing what I was doing and I had an awareness that maybe I would have or experience postnatal depression because I had depression in my teenage years, but I didn't. And I was the mum going, this is easy. Uh, Marley was three months old. He was a sleeper. So I used to go to, like, I thought I knew how to make a baby sleep. Like I had no concept that I just had a child that slept. Just who he was. Yep. And so when he was three months old, I was on this journey to get my body back and then start a business because I was like, well, motherhood's just fucking easy. Like, let's start, let's do something else, which is interesting because I think my whole world just fell apart two years later, but the first two years of being a mom were, I say the word easy with not hesitancy, but it wasn't hard. Yeah. I know it wasn't hard and I didn't have postnatal depression and he did sleep. And I did start a business. Which set you on your path to where you are now. Yeah. Thank fuck you was easy. <laughs> <laughs> so your blog, um, Body Beyond Baby, mm. what led you to just start writing a blog? Like, where did that come from? Because I, I know you now and you're a big journaler. Is, is that something you'd always done? Yeah. And you just sort of then published your thoughts? Or where, where was that inspiration? So I think, so I've journaled my whole life because journals, yeah, somewhere. Dear diary. Dear diary. (laughs) It's been the worst day. (laughs) I could always put words on a page. That's never been hard for me. And I... I'm trying to remember whether I knew I wanted to start the business before the blog. I think it was back in the days when blogs had just kind of started. Yeah. And I, having a business mind, I don't know, I can't remember whether the blog came so that I could start to become known in the space of working with mums or the blog came and then the business. I know that the blog came before the business, but I can't remember if there was a, the blog came as a reason knowing that I was going to start the business or whether yeah. it evolved into that yeah because you mentioned a few times you always knew you wanted to start your business when yeah you were a PT in the gym yeah but you weren't sure what that would look like so do you feel like it was just an accident that it was focused on mums because you just become a new mum yourself or was it a deliberate I've looked at all the aspects of oh gym people. definitely <laughs> wasn't that <laughs> I'm a mum myself so I can identify so I'm going to go down that route or was it like a analysis of like there's something lacking in this area I'm going to fill it or was it just your kind of preoccupation of I'm a mum I want to get my body back I'm a PT I could sandwich these things together let's go I think that can I think that I definitely didn't sit down and do this analysis of all the different things that wasn't it wasn't it and I that's Jen now (laughs) (laughs) well I don't even know sometimes I'm like oh fuck it I'll just do it I don't I don't actually care I don't do a lot of analysis within my business like I, I do and I don't I don't do something because I think that it is going to be successful, there needs to be a reason for doing it to create the success. Mm. And I think back then I was naturally on this journey to get my body back and I was going back into the gym and what I became aware of was that I was surrounded by a lot of women that didn't either have the awareness of, of moving their body and I didn't have the awareness of safe movement back then. 
but I knew enough for my mental health and my physical health or maybe was it my physical well-being or not my fucked up physical health of (laughs) getting my body back so whole yeah anyway um I knew that I I needed time on my own to refine me even though motherhood was easy but refine that part of my identity that was in the gym yeah and again now I look at that and there's so many different thoughts and feelings that go around that was that a healthy reason to be in the gym um I definitely had conversations and part of the reason for starting the business was because so you could be the best mom you can be for your child and now I'm like well no you get to be the best person you can be for yourself yeah um, which makes you a good person for your child. <laughs> yeah, but it shouldn't be. There's so many mums out there now that are still, well, I'll go to the gym because if I go to the gym, then that means that I can be the best mum I can be. Yes, it does, but there's so so much more than that in that you're a human, you're a woman, you, ex, you have the right to do nice things for yourself yeah. <laughs> that you enjoy. Um, yeah, so... I knew that I I fell into a space where lots of women didn't understand what to do in the gym and I saw a gap and I didn't really want to go back to a big box gym. And at the time I thought that I could run training sessions with Marley with me and it would be easy and I could just do that in the park. Okay. So So I did. (laughs) So you birthed the baby and then you birthed the business. Yep. (laughs) And how did that go? How was the birth of the business? So you found the birth of Marley easy and the pregnancy easy. How was the kind of pregnancy period of building a business and the birth of a business I in think, comparison? I don't think that was hard either. Like I don't remember finding it hard and I remember not having massive expectations on myself. So mm-hmm. I had a, you know, a three-month-old, three-month-old baby and you know, I, I went out and started giving flyers out in Centennial Park and found a spot and, you know. I had a, a decent group of women that that wanted to train, and I, I back even back then though I did things like I would go to the um, the early childhood center and do talks. So yeah. I, there was, you know, with the business stuff that I knew, I knew that I wanted to become known. Once I knew what I wanted to do, I knew that I needed to become known for what I wanted to do. Yeah. So right from the get go, again, I was on a mission to become known as the go to trainer for mums in the eastern suburbs, yeah. and that's what I did. So again, I don't remember it being difficult. Yeah. I do also remember though, for the first two years, it was, I want to run this business and I just need to make sure that my child's, once I realized that I couldn't do the business with him with me and because he wasn't like, he's a great kid, always has been like a chilled out kid, but I decided that I wanted to give my full attention to the mums in the group. Yeah. So my financial goals were that he could be in daycare two days a week or three mornings a week or whatever it was. And that didn't cost us money. Yeah. So it, it was like that hobby based yeah. business to begin with, or maybe it wasn't even never a hobby, but it was a slow like a build. Hustle. <laughs> well, it was like being a mom. It's like, yeah. it's got to be a part-time job when they're little, yeah. right? Like even now I like, do it. I mean, we, we try and work full-time hours whilst being full-time moms. Mm. Yay. Yay. Fun. <laughs> All right. So what was your, can you remember your first body beyond baby session? Like nope. at Centennial? No, but I do remember not knowing what I know now. Yeah. So one of the things I say in, in my course um, to new trainers is there's going to be so many things that you're going to learn that you're going to go, holy fuck, does that mean I've just been doing the, the wrong thing the whole time? Yeah. And, you know, permission to just know that you were doing the best job you could do with the information you had right then. Yeah. And that's, what I now know that I didn't know. Is it Brene Brown that says, do what you do until you know better and then do better? Probably. Yeah. I feel like it's one of them. Yeah. (laughs) Yeah. I did figure out early on that I didn't know enough. And I did figure out early on that the courses for trainers at that time were not, they were, they covered pregnancy pretty well, but they definitely didn't cover mm. postpartum. So I discovered, and I don't even know how I discovered them, but um, Joe Murdoch runs the physiotherapy clinic in Bondi Junction. Yep. So really, really early on, I went to meet her to go, I don't know enough. I need to send my clients to you and I need to learn from you. So I was one of the first trainers to 
start to work hand in hand with a women's health now called pelvic health physiotherapists and start to really know better. Okay. So was that the first kind of training you did in mom specific fitness? I'd done a pre and postnatal course through Fitness First, which ticked the box. You know, you've yep. got to tick the insurance box. You, you need to have that certificate yep. to train mums or train pre and postnatal women. But I just, I was like, I don't know where else to go to get information. There was nothing. There's there's a wonderful um, educator called Jenny Burrell out of the UK. So I was watching out for her courses when she came to Australia, but there was just nothing, nowhere to really learn better. So I went to see Jo and yeah, a lot of my education over the years have been, and she still supports us today. Mm. So, yeah. Okay. So that kind of then informed how you train the mums in that postpartum Space. Yeah, like I built built all of our systems and concepts on what I learned from seeing a women's health physiotherapist. Wow. From seeing Joe. Yeah. Thank you so much for being with us for this episode today. As always, it's been an absolute pleasure to have one more conversation that takes us closer to our goal of safe and effective exercise for all women at every stage of motherhood. If you've enjoyed what you've heard, please make sure you hit follow wherever you listen to your podcast and rate and review so more people can join us next time. For further information about anything we've talked about in this episode, head to jendugard.com forward slash podcast. And if you want to connect with me in person, I would love to hear from you over at my Instagram at jendugard. Thank you for your voice in this space. Have a beautiful day.